In today's podcast, I'm delighted to be joined once again by SBC's Rowan Day to talk about the performance of his Tips to Portfolio over the last 12 months. Welcome back to the podcast, Rowan. Thank you, Pete. How's things? Oh, very good. Thank you. Very good at the moment. I'm really looking forward to chatting to you because just like we did last year, we're going to be talking again about your performance over the past 12 months. We do this almost like every tax year and the financial year, April to March, and to talk about the performance of your tips to portfolio. But for those people not familiar with it, do you want to give a quick rundown of why you do the bet diary, your tips to portfolio? Why I do what I do. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and how long have you been doing it? You've been doing it a long time. Uh, it's been you? a long time. You know, I, I was thinking that and I can't actually remember how long I've been doing this for, but it's certainly running into years. Uh, that's the problem when you get to my age, all the years merge tend to merge into one. It must be a good five or six years I've been doing this now. At least. The idea least, of yeah. it is simply to give a, a good idea to readers what it's like to run a portfolio of tipsters. I think it's very easy to read about it and to read about the theory and what you should do. But when it comes to putting everything into practice, it's a little bit different. And, and I think it's sometimes easy to think, oh, gosh, you know, it's, it's dead easy. All you've got to do is work for the best, put them on, blah, blah, blah. And that's all you need to worry about. And actually, there's a little bit more to it than that. A lot more to it mentally. And I think by just charting the progress from week to week, it's easier for someone to say, well, okay, it's quite usual to be down and in a, in a drawdown. But if you stick at it and you persevere and you do all the right things consistently, then ultimately you end up making a, a really good profit from it all. So, yeah, the idea of it is just to give a an overview of what it's like to, to follow a number of tipsters at the same time. Yeah, it's an answer to that question or can you actually make it profit, you know? Yeah. By using this approach. <laughs> yeah, because I hear it all the time. Yeah, it, it, it is all there to see. So, yeah, if I'm losing, then I'm losing very publicly. <laughs> so, it's probably be better to, to be making the money. Yeah, but fortunately, every year so far, touch wood, uh, long may that continue. We've uh, we've been turning a good profit, and as profit, I'm sure it's something you'll, you'll talk about. That there's a profit that's much better that you can get in any other form of investment, really, but something that I'm aware of. Uh, in terms of rate of return. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you don't need any qualifications to get started, really. Well, whereas you or you know, there's not a particularly steep learning curve, like there might be in other walks of life or big sums of money you require if you're, I don't know, buying houses or whatever. So uh, before we get into numbers, I was going to say as well, this is just one way to do it. I always try to you know explain before we dig into it that we're not saying everyone needs to follow how you do it or how I do it or how anyone else does it because yeah. everyone's unique and everyone's going to have you know time constraints family constraints, uh, budget constraints, and, you know, these days, bookmaker constraints. So uh, <laughs> and we'll get into all that, I'm sure. We'll get into all of that. But let's have, let's get into the scores and the doors. How did you perform last year? So the top line figure is the ROI, so the return on investment uh, figure, which was just uh, a shade over 11%, which I was delighted about. I think there's a very natural tendency to think that you can be going for 25 30 40% return on investment. Whereas in fact, if you have a well-balanced portfolio, personally, I feel that's more unlikely. So anything in double digits uh, in terms of return on investment figure, I'm really pleased about. So to hit, uh, I think it's 11.02% to be specific was uh, was something I was very happy about. Of course, ROI isn't just the important thing. I think bank growth is, if anything, more important. The ROI, I think, possibly reflects how healthy your portfolio is and, and how services are performing collectively. But bank growth is where it is in terms of um, the actual amount of money you make. Now, this year, I hit 39.5%, which is a little bit low. I tend to set myself a target each year of 50%. So if I can make 50% of my investment in a year, I think that's a really good year. This year was 39.5%. And there are reasons for that, but I think we'll explore a little bit further as we carry on talking. But yeah, those are the uh, the bottom line figures. Yeah. So that's important to say it's like 39.5% overall as a, you know, it's a function of your growth from your overall bank, not that's one right. particular service. Yeah. And uh, we don't go into the specific financial amounts when, you know, we don't know if you've got 10,000, 20,000, whatever it might be, but it's there to give an indicator. So if you are starting with 2,000, that like you're making... 40% nearly of that. So, you know, if you're starting with 10,000, you're going to make short of £4,000 profit. And if you've got 50,000, it's going to be nearly 20,000 profit. So it's there to give, uh, we've put it in percentage terms so people can yes. kind of relate it to how are they how they might uh, be investing, how much money they might have. But obviously, you've been doing this a lot, like as we spoke about, you've been doing this a while, so you've been able to build 
you know, bankroll up to a point where, you know, you're probably making more than somebody that's going to be starting. But everyone's on a journey and you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? So Yeah, and I think that's important to remember, actually. And I, and I think you asked me at the beginning what the purpose of writing the Bet Diary is. And I think actually something I'm to say, which is very important, is that it does hopefully show people that they can start small and they don't need to be plowing thousands and thousands of pounds into, um, into an investment. And actually, you can build up to being at that level. And, and the things, obviously, that you can do and tactics that you read, you know, you, loads of material on the SBC site in terms of keeping bookmaker accounts open. But it's something you can grow and, and develop. And that's a very important point to make too. So, so, yeah, those figures, you can apply them if you have, as you say, if you have a certain amount of money, you can work out roughly how much you can make potentially by following the, the sort of tips that, that I do. And so how many tips are in your portfolio currently? And I suppose the other question is, how, how much time does it take up on a day or an average week? Yeah, so currently, again, there's never a simple answer to a, a simple question. Is that, so currently, there are 11 services that I actually officially follow. But, so for example, there's a service called Touchdown Profit, which um, specializes in NFL, American football. And of course, it's the American football close season at the moment. Mm-hmm. So... Yes, it's a service in the portfolio, but it's not actually active at the moment. It will become active when the season starts. A racing service that I'm sure many uh, will be familiar with is the Value Better. But of course, Andrew, the TVB only operates through the National Hunt season. The season just come to an end, in fact. So for the next few months, that's not really a part of my portfolio either. But it will be when it starts again. But that gives you an idea. So... In terms of actually actively following at any one time, it tends to vary between 10 and 12 at, at any one time. So it's it's not huge, but it's sizable at the same time. It's not just following two or three. And there's a reason for why I limited at that sort of number, and that alludes to what you just asked me, the amount of time to spend. So like so many people, I imagine, we all live very, very busy lives. And I'd love to be able to say I could sit down and devote a huge amount of time to putting bets on. Uh, I can't. It's as simple as that, just in a practical reason. So the services that I follow tend to be, uh, as a general rule, lower in terms of turnover. So to answer your question, how much time, it's difficult to say, isn't it? But I would estimate, in terms of actually putting bets on, two to three hours a week, something like that. Again, it can vary. It depends what's happening and when, but that would be the rough sort of time I would expect to spend each week in terms of actually physically putting bets on. And obviously, you're probably more time because you keep records and you'll write the, uh, yeah. the bet diary and so on. Absolutely. So, yeah, you can yeah. have time for, for writing the bet diary, of course, but <laughs> keeping records, I don't think I need to remind everybody, keeping an immaculate record of exactly how you're doing and where you're at at all times is, is vitally, vitally important. So, yes, it's uh, something I do. But again, it's easy to, so what I tend to do is, is just dedicate some time, perhaps on a Sunday evening, have my Sunday dinner and there's not much on telly. So I'll just go and sit down for an hour or two and just bring all my records for the week up to date and keep on top of it that way. But it's easy to arrange. If it's something you want to do, it's certainly something that you can easily sort out. Yeah, that's right. And I imagine that you do, there's periods where it's busier than others, like days, for example. I know you do a bunch of golf, so no doubt Tuesdays and Wednesdays are busy with that. And maybe a racing is quiet in the early parts of the week and then it ramps up on a Saturday or during a big festival. And Yeah, you do some, exactly some, that. So, yeah, so, so with the golf, for example, I do... And I think this is something that people have to consider when they're talking about perhaps following tips or a number of tips at the same time is possibly you have to sacrifice something to make it work for you. So make sure that your work that you're putting in is worthwhile and it's going to pay dividends in terms of profit long term. But uh, for as, a, as an example, so golf, I dedicate a couple of hours every Wednesday to putting my golf bets on. Now, some of the services I follow release their picks earlier in the week. And that means that on the occasion, there will be a goal for that. I've not been able to get the official price. Still a good price that I think is a good value, represents good value, but it may be a shade under the actual officially advised price. But I know that by doing that, by sacrificing for some, I, I get my time when I need it to be doing all the other things that life throws at you and all the other things you need to do. So you can very easily mould the portfolio to doing what you want to do. I guess it would be a bit different if you had a horse racing tip to where the odds crashed within minutes, uh, it wouldn't be practical because you'd be taking too much of your edge away. But with the services I follow, quite deliberately, it doesn't work like that. So I'm able to plan and plot exactly when I can place bets and, and when I can't. Yeah, because that's an important point as well, because you know, some tipsters that to, may, might be suitable to individuals who are able to get on a bet the instant that it's released before prices crash. And that's important because obviously uh, maybe a horse racing tipster or 
another sport whereby you know it's important to take five to one before it goes into four to one after two minutes or the pressure of money or even late tips just before a race for example in play tips uh, on certain sports so uh, that's again it goes like you say back to the tailoring it to, to suit you and i was going to ask you what you look for in a tipster but beyond obviously profitability and the ability to fit into your lifestyle is there anything you're looking for and how about how about the risk profile? I was going to say, like, because you know, certain ones, are, the more tempting tipsters in terms of performance are often a little bit more challenging to follow. They're more likely to have longer losing sequences. Yeah, uh, undoubtedly, I, I think with a greater potential reward comes the perhaps more variance, and you can expect perhaps to go through longer periods of, of drawdown, perhaps deeper drawdowns as well. So I do feel I've balanced my portfolio now. It has taken me, it did take me some time to get to achieve that sort of balance. And I, I have quite openly and honestly made mistakes in the past following perfectly good services, perfectly profitable services, but just with the experience I had at the time, the lack of experience I had at the time, just weren't well suited to me psychologically. And it's as simple as, as that. If it doesn't fit you mentally, it's difficult to make money, no matter how good the, that tipster is. So yeah, in terms of what I look for in a tip, so I, I tend not to go too much for, certainly with racing services that go for very long prices, it just doesn't suit me. It's just not my style, as it were. Having said that, as I've gained more experience, my attitude and also what I'm looking for, my appetite for risk has actually grown a bit, which is why it's one significant reason why over the last 12 to 18 months, the golf section of the portfolio has grown so much. Obviously, with golf betting, you're often backing at prices of 50 to 1 and upwards, 80 to 1, 100 to 1, 150 to 1. Uh, we had a place last week, didn't we, at 500 to 1. So, 500, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So that has represented a bit of a shift in, in my own outlook, but that has purely come from experience and seeing that, yeah, you know, it is possible to get through the down times. And if you do persevere and you do stick with it and you stick to your principles, you'll come out the other side and you'll make really good profit. So again, it depends on the individual. But sorry, just to answer your question about what do I look for in a tipster, a couple of basic things. I look for a good SBC review for a start. <laughs> well, you're often writing the review as well, Rowan. So, you know, you're... Well, well yeah, I write them. So <laughs> I've never understood, and I see it all the time, I've never understood why people start gambling as opposed to investing, if I can make a, a bit of a subtle distinction there, mm -hmm. in services that haven't proven themselves, who don't prove themselves independently to the SBC. There has never been any sort of in-depth analysis of whose claims to results have never really been tested or, or analysed at all. Why, why would you? I just, don't, I just don't get it. That's not to say there aren't tipsers out there who are very good that haven't had a review yet. I mean, obviously, I'm sure there are. We'll, we'll see them in the SBC magazines as we move forward. But why take the risk? Why, why not just wait until you've got a review? It's been independently analysed. They've been proving independently. Surely that gives you a lot more confidence. That's the first thing I, I look for. And secondly... It goes back to what you're saying, it has to fit. So when the bets are released, can I get on? And if I can't get on when they're released, by the time I can get on, will the odds have dropped too much? Because if they have, this is, no matter how good that tips is, it's just not going to work for me. But again, that's the sort of information that you can read in the odds tracking sections that we put into the reviews. Um, yeah. But in a nutshell, those are the two things that really steer me. And if a service ticks both those boxes, then I'm, I'm really interested. Yeah, well, there's always new reviews coming up or just published. Uh, the, some more recently, uh, some racing tips that I've been tracking for a while that have exceptional records. And just this week, I was talk talking to somebody who's a golf and snooker tips who looks really, really good. So yeah, there's always, if you like, some quality sites out there. And then it's a matter of yeah, taking the time to explore what they do and getting that confidence that they have an edge and you're confident that they're, they're professionally run, all those kind of things. But uh, I wanted to ask you about what's changed in the last 12 months, new additions to your portfolio. You mentioned there you've maybe taken a little bit more risk and do you want to discuss, is there a couple of services or one service that you want to discuss that you've introduced over the past 12 yeah, months? Yeah, so there's oh, a no. service that I introduced very recently, which is the Bookie Bashing Racing Tracker. And that's, uh, I, I, we're just talking about um, longer prices, haven't we, in variance and how my attitude to that has, has shifted over the last a couple of years or so, two or three years or so. So the reason I chose this one is that it's the same people that do the weekly golf value service, which last year I had tremendous success from, uh, had really good success. And I can see why as well, which is important. When you can yeah. see why you're being successful, it, it adds to the confidence and belief that you have in that particular service. I, um, having been fortunate enough to be in a position to go 
been involved with writing some of the reviews there, was aware of the racing tracker. And for those that don't know, this is a tool, a piece of software, I guess you'd call it. Call it. it seems to be downplaying it a little bit. I think there's a lot more to it than that, which identifies horses that are running, that represent, his prices represent value in the place market. So the each way, place part of the any each way bet, and then rolling them up into multiples. So you're compounding the value in each bet that you're you're placing. Now, having had all the information through and the analysis through that the SBC did in terms of writing the review, I realized that here is a service that you can use for a fair amount of time, I'm hoping, and certainly it's proven to be the case, to go under the radar with the bookmakers because, let's face it, I think multiple bets is a suggestion that perhaps somebody is a bit of a, of a mug punter and, and, mm-hmm. and going for <laughs> the, the big winning lottery ticket all the time and continually failing uh, to hit it. But in fact, because you're playing at value prices, it is only a matter of time until you hit some good wins. So there are all sorts of reasons for, for wanting to introduce that service into the portfolio. The other reason is that you can dip into it at any time during the day, really. So if you've got a spare couple of minutes, I do it when I'm going to make a cup of tea. <laughs> you know, I'll just have a quick look. I may be working, but I'm going to put uh, the kettle on. While the kettle's boiling, I'll quickly log in, see what possible bets quickly put one down, a good multiple down if there's one there. And by doing that, on a quiet day's racing, I'm still getting one or two lucky 15s, which is the policy that they um, that I choose to follow, strategy I choose to follow, down on a, say, on a quiet Monday or Tuesday, and then on a busier Friday, Saturday, then there could be as many as seven or eight that you can put down. But it's that flexibility that, that really appealed to me. So yeah, but a whole number of reasons why, why I introduced that. And thank goodness I did, because I was and maybe this is something we're going to come on to later, but I was incredibly fortunate that in the first few weeks of following, I had a, a big, big win from it, which uh, is always nice when, when that happens. Especially early doors. Yeah, well, let's talk about that because that's one of the references in terms of bank growth. Uh, so in an individual service, I believe it was 116% you've made and you've only been following them for a few months. Is that right? Yeah. So <laughs> this puts in the, the one win into context. And I have had a, a second really nice size winner as well, only about the fifth decide about 20% of the return on the big one. So I operate a 100-point bank. So every lucky 15 I place, I stake one point, essentially, of the bank that I attribute to the racing tracker, the bookie bashing racing tracker. That one win netted 90, I can't quite remember, 93, 94 points of profit. So that yeah. one bet almost doubled my bank. Yeah, so, so I'm going. Yeah, and that's where the 116% comes from. And fortunately so far, and I know you use this as well, Pete, so maybe this is your yeah. experience as well, but so far I've not experienced a big drawdown um, at all. Uh, you do get a continual, quite regular supply of little wins that, okay, so that your profit and loss graph may be just tracking down but nicely and gradually. So it's only a matter of time you're not lost too much before hopefully that next big win comes through and rockets you back up again. I don't know if that's something that you've experienced, but so far in the couple of months I've been following, that's that's been my experience. Yeah, that's a similar experience to me. I actually, it's funny you mentioned that I'm actually in a bit of a drawdown with it at the moment, but that's just you know par for the course really. And and if service like this it's more higher risk. Well depending on the type of profile of bets, obviously if you play some multiples, certainly that's the case. But uh yeah, I mean, you, someone might think, oh, you got lucky with that big win. But um, I f- often find with products and services like this, it's about volume. So the more volume you can get down, the more chance that you're going to you know, hit a big winner or have those tickets which return um, a good, a sizable sum of money. But it is high risk because, yeah, you're waiting for for those wins. But the more you can put down, and, and volume is important, I think, uh, across the board you know if you're placing 100 bets in a year you're really vulnerable to variance if you're placing 10,000 bets a year that should even out a fair bit so absolutely it's interesting when i very first started using it before i had that win i think that win came in something like the third or fourth week of, of, of my using it i could see that it was only a matter of time because you can see that so so say you have three or four on an average day and the time i have i'm, I'm placing about three or four on average lucky 15s a day and you could see that you get two places in one and a winner in a place in another the lucky 15 you get say two but maybe three places and you could see that it is only a matter of time until you get one bet where they all place plus a couple of winners it is going to happen and you can almost see it and you say, right, okay this is fine because i've just got to be patient it's as simple as that and and yeah it was interesting when i was actually just 
kind of testing out the service right at the very beginning. It didn't take long for me to realize that as long as I kept doing what I was doing, a big win would come. Now, that could happen the following day. It might not happen for six months. Who knows? But it will come. I mean, that's the patience you need. And obviously, that's a like, slightly higher risk uh, strategy and that works for you. Perhaps not ideal for somebody just starting out of one service. I don't know. Maybe it would be. It depends on the profile of person. But because you have those more steady services within your portfolio, and you've obviously you're playing with bookmaker money, it gives you so much more confidence to to take a chance on, on something like I, this. I think that's that. a really important point. Actually, I think the balance. Uh, you know, I think putting all your eggs into one basket in terms of one service is not necessarily a sensible thing to do because it only takes a bad run. So I think your confidence can be really seriously knocked. So my advice would be to always start with at least two or three services, and they can be, you know, they can be free to follow. I know you've got free services um, on all yeah. the but that provide good returns. Why not build up a bank using those before you start investing in, in paid for tips? That's, that's one op- option, one approach you can take. But yeah, I, I think balance in the portfolio is essential. If, you, if you've got a risky, I say riskier, maybe that's a little more higher variance service, yep. balance it out with one that's really steady. Your ROI expectation must, might be much, much lower, but it balances each, they balance each other out. And I think that's a really useful thing to, to try and to get into a portfolio as early as you possibly can. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, that kind of moves on nicely. So I was going to talk about golf. Recording this towards the end of April, and it might not go out for a few weeks, but there, because obviously we talked about the numbers for the past 12 months. But during April, I think golf had a pretty poor performance. Yeah. And I think that anyone that maybe had a, just a sole golf portfolio might be struggling during April and thinking, what's the fuss about? But then almost that's part of the reason to diversify into other sports. And maybe, you know, because golf attracts people because, you know, you can see services that make 30%, 40% return investment. But equally, there is the flip side to it where you can go a couple of weeks without hitting a winner or sometimes a little bit longer and, and it test that patience. But then if you have some more, you know, the 5 10% ROI services that kind of ticking over quite nicely and just don't maybe give you that big, big win, but just continually contribute small profits which accumulate over time. So having that uh, diversity uh, certainly helps. So let's talk about golf then and your experiences of that. And maybe that fits in quite nicely of how you handle the losing runs that golf can bring. Yeah, it is very topical actually, because you're right. I think this is the slowest period I've had in, in my golf betting career so far, actually. And as you know, Peter, betting on golf to, to any great extent is, is something that's relatively new to me. It was only, as I say, gosh, beginning of uh, of last year. And so beginning of 2021 that I actually thought, right, OK, I'm going to really take this seriously and, and build up a, a mini portfolio within the portfolio, if you like, of golf tipsters. And for much of 2021, it, it was happy days, you know. <laughs> I remember there was one famous weekend where Weekly Golf Valley gave the winner of both the European and PGA tours and what a Sunday that was. Yeah, I think someone had the double on yeah. that one. Oh, how nice! Not me, unfortunately. But how nice <laughs> that? But he could be referring to. And from there, I never really, I didn't really have a steep drawdown in golf. So really, the, my first experience of a of a much slower period and services struggling collectively has been this year, and, and probably just in the midst of it. And actually, my most recent golf bet diary post, I, I, I reread it, I read it back to myself after it, and I thought, gosh, that's under it gloomy and been doing it. I didn't actually quite mean it to sound like that. I think you have to accept when it comes to golf that you are going to have extended periods of, of not having winners because the odd, we've said it 10 minutes ago, the odds for you, you're playing at. But it's interesting. I think of a seven service, off the top of my head, of the seven service that currently follow, I think five currently are in their worst drawdown today for this year. So, so it's, it's not a, a great time at the moment. But a bit like what I was saying about the racing tracker, you can see how quickly that period could completely just switch around and you could make a huge profit in one weekend. You know, you can see golfers finishing fairly high up the lead, but not quite high up enough to, uh, you know, maybe finish 10th instead of the in the top seven you, you might need for the each way, the place return. And you can see that there's some overlap, obviously, in some of the golfers that have been tipped by the different services. It only takes one golfer that's been tipped a couple of times to come in and suddenly you will have made up all the loss and shot into profit just with that one one bet 
or, or say one golfer, I should say, as opposed to one bet. So yeah, I, I don't know about you, but you, you can see that, it, it, again, it is only a matter of time. And particularly when each of the golf services that you follow have got such a fine record long term, you know, they're averaging so anywhere between sort of 20 and 45% return on investment over two, three, four, five years or so, then you know they've got what it takes. You just, again, you just got to be patient. Make sure you've got your betting banks built properly so you, you've got that. So um, you've got the, the comfort of knowing that, you know, you're not going broke or anything like that. Ride it out and the profit will come. And I, I don't think there's anything more to say about actually coping with it. You've just got to believe it will turn because it will. And it always has Yeah, and, ha- and having the bankroll in place, it would probably be a little bit unfair because I think January and February, it was some of the best performance I'd seen for a long time. You know, we had winner after winner. I think I remember is it Scotty Scheffler won his first tournament in a playoff. And for me, I was like, oh, this is unreal. It's just what a phenomenal start, I think, the first four tournaments. And then obviously you have the balancing out of that to reverting to the mean that we're in. So it's all, all very much goes to the point of view of why we do these 12-month reports to say, well, okay, one month's bad, but that's more than balanced out by the three months prior to that. And you have to judge products and services uh, not over a few weeks. This is not the football industry. We're not... You're not, you know, the, <laughs> you're not Sir Alex Ferguson one week and whoever, Frank Lampard the next, you know, you're going to get fired. You know, you have to take it over the long term and you have to be patient and disciplined. Yeah, and you do. I mean, actually, goal. just on that point, it's a very good point you make. I mean, and, and that, actually, that's an interesting psychological point, actually, how quickly you can forget the good times when not so good times come along. And that is a problem I think a lot of betters make or have and, and struggle to cope with. But they, I've read several things where it's scientifically accepted that the human brain is wired in such a way that you very, very quickly forget the good times when you're worrying about the not so good times. And it's it's interesting what you say there, January and February, actually, that the year did get off to a really good start. And just to qualify what I was saying about five of the seven tips as being on a, a sort of a deepest drawdown of the year today, you've got to put that a little bit in context because weekly golf value up until recently was, uh, I think last week or the week before was, was one of those, but it's still very nicely in profit. <laughs> you know, it's still running along at about 35, 38% return on investment for the year. It's just that it had those incredible highs in January, February, and it hasn't had one since, so it's come down. So yeah, it, it's important to put that sort of spell in, in its true context, I think. Yeah, that's really true. Let's continue to talk about Maybe a few other disappointing guys, because you know the reality is that uh, the portfolio, that's the reason you have a portfolio, because you might have 12 tipsters within it. Two or three are probably not, hopefully no more than that. You know, ideally none, but there's always going to be a couple that maybe don't fire and hit their straps. So there's been a couple this year, for example, I think the value better you referenced before, you know, by his own high standards, he normally hits 30, 40% ROI. But again, he is somebody that maybe doesn't tip that many bets. So it's always vulnerable to yeah. your know, break even year, I suppose. Yeah, 100%. So any longer term readers of the Bet Diary will know the esteem I hold, Andrew, who runs the, the Value Better service. Um, and the, the guy is, I think this word is often overused, but I, I think he's a genius when it comes to reading for and being a tipster. I, I think. He, uh, by his own admission, finds it uh, difficult sometimes to find value, which obviously you need to do to run a successful tipping service. But he's always had the patience to wait for that value to present itself. And as you say, he's got a fabulous record, an amazing long-term record. And to be hidden sort of return on investment levels he has done for as long as he has, you've got to have genuine talent. But I think he's found it harder to to find value at times uh, over the last 12 months, which has resulted in a lower volume of bets. And that's exactly what you just said there. You just hit the nail on the head. When you have such a a relatively small data set, then you you don't give time for variance to to ride out, do you? And and therefore, you're going to have extended periods in terms of time, if not necessarily in terms of numbers of bets, where things are not going well. And unfortunately, that's happened to the value better this year. But you know what? I, I think that's inevitable. And Something that struck me when it's come to when I've been able to write the SBC reviews, Pete, is that very few services that have gone on for any length of time have escaped a losing year completely. You know, some of the best tipsters out there, have you look back at their record, and there's always one or two years where they didn't turn a profit. But then they come out of that and they show their value by bouncing back and getting back on track and making a fine profit again. And it's probably not because they're changing anything. They're not changing their methods or... Uh, their approach or they're not being affected by things psychologically they're doing exactly what they've always done it's just variance and you've got to accept that's going to kick in and, and hurt. you get positive variance too of course you know when they get that 
those two winners we mentioned in, in the one weekend for weekly golf value. That's positive variance in its, uh, in its most acute form, isn't it? So yeah, I, I have no worries or concerns about the value better, but you do have to accept that even the very best services are going to go through spells where things don't quite go forward through no fault of anybody. Just fate of the, the, the betting guards, aren't they? And, and no one can escape. It's very true. And uh, we do the Monte Carlo simulations for every service that we review. Uh, Mark, our analyst, runs that. And that simulates like millions worth of the same profile of bets. And we have a calculation that says likelihood of a losing year. I can't remember putting a zero percent in. You know, you might get 10 percent, 15 percent. So you're going to get one in 10 years, one in eight years. And very often, you know, when you see it's it's funny how how often I might see a reviewer a tip. I think the last one, it said one in eight and then I looked at their record. And it was one in eight. They'd had one in eight losing years in the actual life performance. So uh, even the best experts have bad runs. And like I say, it can sometimes be down to get a little bit of variance, maybe not that huge, uh, not a huge number of bets. So you know, we have to be careful that we don't rush to judgment in complete data samples. Um, I just wanted to ask you about an overlooked sport we haven't really touched on in the past here, and that would be arrows, the darts. Everyone loves the darts. Yeah. So... Yeah, so on the Oc is a, 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 a long term uh, service. How long's how long's Rich been running that service for? There's over a decade now. Over a decade is a real long term. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can believe it. It's been going for, for many, many years. And there's a fine example, actually, of a, of a tips of that by being an absolute expert in, in his or her chosen field can continue to make it pay despite markets changing and different pressures affecting the sport that they specialize in. So, um, so on the hockey, so yeah. So again, a bit like the value better, it's, it's a relatively low turnover service. There aren't that many bets on that many darts tons. It's not like football where you, you're playing 38 league games a, a season. There aren't that many um, competitions to, obviously to get involved with. But last year, um, or this April to, um, to April, um, the year just gone, uh, we hit 51% Return on capital, so bank growth, in other words, from um, from the DAS betting, and thirty percent, just over thirty percent in terms of return on investment figures. And this is in, I think, more than any other sport. I think darts is a, a sport that you can see the bookies have become far more savvy within. I, I remember yeah. when on the hockey first started out, they were able to be hitting return on investment figures of 40 percent because the bookies just didn't pay any heed to it. But of course, as the sport became a lot more popular. Um, we've seen how popular the World Championships are. It's um, uh, is it Ali Pali, isn't it? In, Ali in, Pali, at the yeah. end of the year, or what madness that, that is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's become a real spectator sport, television spectator sport, hasn't it? And it sounds great, yeah. but I'd love to go, I must admit. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> um, so it's become much more popular, and of course, as it becomes more popular, it becomes more popular for recreational uh, better to, to bet on as a, as a sport, which means that the bookmakers suddenly realise that actually, you know what, we could make some really good income here and they put some resources into it and they have market makers that are far more um, aware and savvy themselves of the market. So the market or the margins within the market have definitely shrunk over the years. So to hit a 30% return on the investment figure in a 12-month period and to hit bank growth of 50 percent, 51%, I think that's a tremendous testament. To, uh, to to the guys there that's uh, on the hockey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely one worth checking out. It's a Hall of Fame service, like I so said, it's been around maybe even 15 years and it's had to adapt and evolve like we all have to with our betting, but it's still going strong and certainly it shows the value of somebody who knows uh, you know, a sport and a betting market inside out. A good shout out as well because let's wrap up talking about some of the services but Nova Monkey Punter another long term yeah. racing service had a great year too didn't he yeah it, he did and it always it always amuses me I don't know why it always amuses me because I think Wayne himself would um, classify himself as very much a flat specialist uh, but last year's Cheltenham Festival was um, was tremendously profitable for him and then he kicked on from there didn't he and, and had a, a fantastic summer as well so yeah I was really pleased at, at, about that He's a, a smashing chap, and um, I've never known anybody uh, pay more heat to customer service than he does. And that, the work he must put into that service, I'm sure look, all the tipsters do clearly, you have to, to, to be profitable consistently. But, you know, he'll, you'll get long emails from, from Wayne, and, and they're clearly at the end of a really long, hard working day for him. So you just will him to do well. He deserves yeah. to do well. Um, so yeah, it was fantastic that um, that last year we we more than doubled the band very comfortably, 
um, what ran along quite happily at a 20 to 25% return on investment figure. It was, it was just a, a golden year for it. So uh, yeah, really, really pleased about that. Yeah. No, that's that's. Uh, it's always like nice to see the good guys doing well. Yeah. And I think uh, what maybe the central point from some of the services we talked about today is the longevity. Uh, yeah. The several that you talked about that have been around maybe a decade, sometimes longer. And I feel like sometimes they get overlooked because people are looking for, you know, uh, the silver bullet service. Well, that's yeah, going to the, the bright shiny new thing syndrome. Exactly. It? Something's going to be a bit more exactly. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there's often a value in that longevity and that trust and that professionalism and that expertise, you know, how to profit. But yeah, maybe they're not they're not uh, invincible when it comes to losing runs or such like and people uh, go from service to service. But it's a good point about uh, sticking sticking to those that you can trust uh, and, yeah. and that will, over time, repay that trust uh, as, perform, as, per, as per their performance. And yeah. I also wanted to circle around and talk about the general topic, I suppose, mm-hmm. about which... You know, as part of parcel these days of get of your betting and running a portfolio is getting your bets on and restrictions. <laughs> yeah. Now, Rob, we talked about this before. Has much changed on that front for you in the past twelve months? Uh, you know what? I was thinking long and hard about this in, in the right sense. I, I don't think it has. I, I I'm not finding it. I'm not finding I'm needing to do anything different this year to what I did last year to to maintain accounts. And, and look, I, I think. Again, you have to accept that you are going to lose accounts. If, you, if you're making money, at, at yeah. some point you are going to lose accounts and, or have it severely restricted. Um, but I found myself using um, the exchanges perhaps more um, over the last two years than, than I had done previously, including for, for horse racing. So, um, you, you know, I think if you bet seriously for even a short period of time, you can wait for buy to best odds guarantee concessions, can't you? Which is why in the reviews we we and always try and make sure that we've got results that don't have BOG uh, applied to them because, quite frankly, to many, it's not realistically attainable. Um, so you have to accept that that disappears. So my attitude has shifted a little bit, I guess, in the sense that if we've got a win-only bet, so for example, the value better tends to tip win-only all the time. Um, yeah. He, you know, I'll, you often get a better price on the exchanges you don't have to rush to get the bet on because I think people sometimes do enforce the price on the exchanges down a little prematurely, which is highly irritating for everybody because then the bookies can, can follow suit. But you give it some time and the price bounces back. And generally speaking, you can at least equal the advice price. And sometimes, actually, you, you can get better than the advice price. And that's after the, the deduction of commission on any winnings as well. So I found myself using uh, Smarkets uh, a lot more um than perhaps had done previously um and after that it, it's a case of being sensible so uh a, a great service that um is low return investment but good turnover and and um good consistent solid approach is the poacher and all those prices of all his bets are, are quoted um and available on betfair and again occasionally you know i'll go to the relevant market i'll find that prices dips a little bit i presume through the weight of members money but generally speaking, they always bounce back. And even if not, um, you know, I often put a little um, bet in and, and keep it if I'm matched when the match goes into play. And generally speaking, it's always matched within the first five minutes. People have told me that, it, you know, you start losing value as soon as the, as the um, whistle for kickoff goes. The way I look at it is if you're getting on in the first five minutes, well, you've still got a 90-minute game because you're going to get five minutes of injury time at the other end. So it just really made that <laughs> much difference. Um, and I've certainly not had any issues in, in that regard. I'm making a good profit using that method when I need to, but generally speaking, I can get on anyway on, um, on the exchanges. One thing I, I am and have started to be very careful of is trying to keep my stake as low as possible by spreading my bets. So if there's a, if there's a bet that's available at the same price, across three bookmakers, I will split my stake through by three ways and, and yeah. equalize it on three books. It, it does take a fraction longer, but if you've got all your bookmaker windows open, you only you're literally talking seconds extra. You're not talking like minutes extra for each bet. Um, and keeping those stakes as low as possible with each individual um, bookmaker account that you may have. And the other thing, this is an old one, I think, is that I'm always very reluctant to take a... a, a an absolute outstanding price. I would rather say if a, if a horse is, is tipped uh, so Wayne at, at Northern Monkey is a really good example of this to give you a working example briefly. So Wayne, for his official results, I think takes, uh, how does he, he do it? He doesn't take the outstanding um, price. Um, 
So, I think he does both now, Roman. I think, I think he, he does he do both. both. Actually, you're so right. you can you're see right. the comparison by taking the absolute best and the lowest. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But I've always judged my uh, performance with um, Northern Monkey from not taking an outstanding price. And actually, I will often go three prices a lot. So if the horse is tipped at, say, seven to one with one bookmaker, 13 to two at the next two bookmakers, I'll go and split my stake across the 13 to two, as opposed to putting a bigger stake on an outstanding price, because I think that is a very quick way of getting your account smart. Um, so that's something I, I do as well. So, and it, it generally seems to work. I mean, I, you know, I, as you say, we're not going to go into a, amounts, but I, you, you don't actually have to stay that much to make a level of profit that certainly that I'm happy with. Um, so by doing that, I do feel I can stay under the radar longer than, than perhaps um, I, I, I might otherwise. And I, something else I have started doing is just throwing the odd daft bet on a football match in play, um, usually with my beloved Arsenal if we're losing. I know it's throwing away <laughs> good money because we never come back from behind anymore. Uh, but I'll stick a, a tenner on Arsenal to win by two goals or something daft like that. Um, yeah. And I do think that just um, doing that occasionally as well can't do any harm in terms of account longevity if they can say, oh, you know, he's, he's obviously doing this for a bit of fun and he's maybe hit a couple of big wins. It's um, oh, good advice. But yeah, so I, I, I think I've been largely unaffected by, um, you know, I've lost, I think over the last 12 months, I've lost two accounts and, and they weren't with bookies that you would have any expectation of it lasting very <laughs> long. <laughs> so, yeah, I've been okay these last ones. Hopefully that will continue. Who knows? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of debate right now. Obviously, we've got the affordability limits that are kicking in for some people, the deposit limits. So that might be a factor if we talk about it in the future, if that starts to kick in or they become employed across the board by law. Because, you know, if you have variants, you might lose more in one effort, well, with one account. That's what we often advise people to do, to spread it around and let variants be your friend. Uh, that might impact things. And I always see it. We don't expect bookmakers to prop us up in terms of an income. We expect it to be a bit of a game of cat and mouse, but perhaps it's... It's a little bit more too far one way at the moment in terms of, especially the hobbyist betters. You know, people maybe listen to this who who maybe have made a small profit or you know they're starting. To, they are already struggling with with restrictions. So uh, the advice you give there is good here, especially betting win only, taking prices later uh, on the exchanges or with bookmakers. All things that do seem to help with longevity. So uh, I, I was also going to say there's a good value I find uh, in, in developing uh, relationships with people, talking to other people. Maybe now with COVID, people are more open to talking online, especially, and maybe not sharing too much initially, but as you develop those relationships, I find you often, you know, there's other ways that you can get your bets on or give you some advice and information about other bookmakers you might not have considered. That's certainly something that's opened up to me recently, uh, smaller firms, for example. So there's a myriad of ways to get on. And sometimes it's maybe not in the public domain, but with a little bit of talk to somebody you trust, who trusts you and they can share something, you can figure a few things out because there's some ways that I get on with some firms and what have you that people don't know about and I don't really shout about because if I did, it would go for everybody. <laughs> so just, yeah, that's just my encouragement would be to say, go and have a look, talk to a few people, see if you can build those relationships and you never know what, what might come back. Yeah, no, that's sound advice. I, I think that's the like that's way walk of life, can't you? The more people you know, the more information you can soak in, the, the better position you'll be in. Yeah, that's that sounds sound advice there. Yeah. And, and then moving forward, it's um, continue with the portfolio. Obviously, you write about it every week on the Bet Diary online. And you're going to continue with the, the overview. Obviously, your tweak as you go, no doubt. When we talk next year, you may have changed a couple of things. It's continuing with the same path. Yeah, I, I think so. There's no reason not to. You, you know, I'm turning over a profit that I enjoy. I'm doing it in a way that is about as stress free as I can make it. So, so yeah. why change a winning formula in that respect? My attitude to risk is I'm, I'm very risk averse. I, I, I don't like taking risks that I don't need to. It sounds crazy, doesn't it, when you're talking about betting that you, well, how can you possibly be completely risk averse when you, you talk about betting? But by setting yourself up properly, I, I apply very, very little leverage to my funds. So my betting bank is literally my betting bank. And I think there's a tendency you, you could make figures look a little sexier, if you like, by applying a lot of leverage. Yeah. But I don't need to do that. Why would I want to do that? I'm, I'm pleased with the sort of money that I'm being able to make. It's a significant amount of money that, that contributes to nice things in life. And I'm doing, as I say, in a way that minimizes risk. So my plan for this year is, is very much to carry on as, as is. And yeah, there are always inevitably little tweaks that you make along the way. But 
actually, as we as things stand at the moment, I don't anticipate. I'm you know not thinking, oh gosh, you know I've got to change this, and I've got to change that, and I've got to introduce something new. I'm not in that position at all. So it is very very much a case of carrying on as 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 we've been going. Yeah, but that's probably goes to why you've been doing it so long and so so successful is because you're not looking for the big win or that moonshot. I think Boris Johnson would call it to change everything. It's let's not talk about politics, but it's simply you know it's it's a steady way of making a return without causing the potential to burn out or to blow up entirely. And I think um, it's a very sensible way of doing it. And I always enjoy reading your blogs. And for those people who you know are interested in learning more, obviously there's a report that's out at the time of the release of this podcast uh, talking about all the things we've explained today in more detail, you know, the individual services, the overview, and you know, also the long-term figures. So people can read it there. And, and they can also get it uh, on the Bet Diary, smartbettingclub.com slash betdiary. You can read that. Is it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday they go up? You I, know, I, I try sports. to keep, I, I must admit, Peter, I've got a dreadful confession to make that I'm just going <laughs> to do it for Tuesday and Wednesday this week. I feel dreadful. So I am going to put up a, a catch up post over the weekend. But 99 times out of 100, yeah, it, it's golf on the Monday because obviously yeah. the, the tournaments finish on the Sunday. Uh, so yeah. it's topical. Then we have the sports services roundup on the Tuesday and then the racing on the Wednesday. So yeah, 99 times out of 100. Appreciate it. I might be in detention for, for missing it out this week, but I will catch up, I promise. <laughs> well, it has been the Easter weekend and, and, and uh, you know, we all, um, you have got to go spend those winnings something your own, you know, you've got to <laughs> get that helicopter flight. Yeah, I'm out on the town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get your Ferrari in your helicopter. Yeah. Yeah, until, until 8.30 when I get too tired and I can come on. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's really good inspiration for people that are interested in the whole concept, you know, whether you think, oh, it's, it's a fallacy, you can't actually make a profit, or if you're somebody that, is doing it. Maybe you're interested in learning more, or even if you're struggling or looking for some advice, there's always good inspiration there to, to kind of uh, to give you an outline of how one person's uh, doing it and have been doing it for a while. So if you don't, if you haven't checked it out yet, go check out smartbettingclub.com slash bet diary. Go read the information from Rowan every week and you can get the email sent to you as well. It's a really good resource. And you know, thank you ever so much, Rowan. I hopefully we'll reconvene, uh, you know, in April, May 2023 and we'll be talking about another season. Yeah, yeah that's, fingers crossed. I hope so. Fingers crossed. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you. Thank you.